Um, I am going to introduce, um, I'm going to introduce you both just to get started, but um, this is uh, Wendy and Jill. So Jill Whistler is a registered dietitian. This is Jill, and uh, she has her certification from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and Adult and Childhood Weight Management, certified health and fitness specialist by the American College of Sports Medicine, and she works for the Tahoe Forest Health System over in Truckee. This is Wendy Buchanan. Wendy is, uh, has her master's in science, is a lead exercise physiologist and certified exercise specialist by the American College of Sports Medicine. And she's the main exercise physiologist for cardiac rehab at Tarho Forest Hospital. So um, I think we'll turn it over first to Jill. And so let's uh, give both of them a warm welcome. a non-mic. If you guys cannot hear me, please like give me the ear sign or something, because I know that that projector is loud. Um, let's get, ahead and get started. Our goal for tonight, Wendy and I kind of want to get you thinking about first, kind of five things you can do nutrition-wise to have a healthier lifestyle, healthier living, and then Wendy hopefully is going to encourage you to implement five new exercise um, regimes to keep you more active. All right, so right out of the gate, I want to know, is obesity contagious? Yeah. Yes. Is it a virus? <laughs> you can get a shot. <laughs> um, <clears throat> who do you think affects you the most? Is it our spouse, right, because we always kind of want to blame them? Or is it the sibling that's overweight or obese, right, is it our genetic makeup, essentially? Or is it our friends? What do you guys think? All of the above. All of the above. <laughs> All of the above. Which one do you think is the highest one? Spouse. Spouse. It's friends. It's friends. Hands down. It's friends. It's friends. Which is interesting. Um, it's actually most friends, and I put slash coworkers. Okay. So it's the people that you're around most of the time. Ironically, whether it's like a social event or lunch or hey, it's noon. Whatever it is, but it's our friends that actually affect us the most, even more so than your genetic disposition. Your genetic disposition of being overweight is actually about 32%. So you, I look at that as, okay, you got to get almost 70% that you can control, you know, within range. you got to work with what you're given to, to some extent. Um, I wanted to go through these, and if you, some of you have seen these before, just bear with me. The Center for Disease Control does a study every year, and they um, started calling people up and asking them how tall you are and how much you weigh. <clears throat> now, we live in a very honest country, and if you think driver's <coughs> license, that's the variable in this. So men generally made themselves taller, and women generally made themselves a little leaner. Right? You guys kind of agree, like right? driver's license, you know? Okay, so that's the variable in this study. So think about that when I'm going through these slides. So they're calling each state and finding out within that state how many people are coming in and over 30 pounds of being overweight, okay? And that puts them into a higher BMI to an obese category, all right? So here we have no data, less than 10% and 10 to 14% on the darker blue states. This is 1988, so here we go, 89, 90, 91, we added a new category, 15 to 19% of the state is obese. 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, the trendsetters in Mississippi, greater than 20% of the state, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, again, those trendsetters, right now you're Rocky Mountain High, 2002, 2003, 2004, 2005, we added a whole new category, greater than 35%, 6, 7, Eight, nine, and ten. I'd like to move. <laughs> to Europe? <laughs> right? So just to let you guys know, I pulled out the CDC website and I was looking at it. In Mississippi is 34.9% in 2011. So they're going to be adding a whole other darker red, purple, black. I mean, it should be a black. I don't know. I mean, 30, over 35% of the state is obese. Not even overweight. That is an obese category. So, I mean, just to understand this, you guys, each decade is like fast-moving train 
to an obesity epidemic. And it's not getting any prettier, and it's affecting our kids, right? This is the first generation that's not going to outlive their parents. I mean, that is scary. That's scary. So what's going to change? The health healthcare reform? Or you know, what, what do we got? What do we have? So this is what's happening is, right, we, we have a generally an, um, a graying America. We have, you know, the baby boomers coming in. We have more people living longer. We have a higher number of people who are older, 44 and up, 45 and up, right? And what's happening is physically we're not as active. Our basal metabolic rate, you know, decreases about 8% on an average every decade. And then to me, the biggest thing is our eating habits are not changing to reflect the amount of inactivity and um, body change, and body composition change. Based on metabolic rate. Okay? And then we know what happens when this is out of the body mass index, extremely obese, obese, overweight, and then a healthy weight, when you maintain a healthy weight, or you're putting on pounds, heart disease, stroke, arthritis, hypertension, gallstones, and diabetes are all increasing our risk. And then there's the visceral fat factor. It is much more harmful when we have fat, especially like the subcutaneous fat and even the peritoneal fat around our organs, right? Because then blood sugar sticks and stays in our bloodstream. It doesn't get into the cells because it's blocked by fat. So we have an increase in diabetes or insulin sensitivity. So we're seeing a huge surge in this. And subcutaneous fat is a non-harmful fat. So like if I jump up and down, it's the fat that moves. Okay? <laughs> kind of think of it that way. It's the rock hard fat that we got to be careful of. Okay? <clears throat> this came out um, two years ago. This is what's happening with our risk of cancer. We're seeing a huge surge in cancer increase. And now we're kind of correlating it to being obese. Again, here's that healthy weight, overweight to obese category, greater than 30%. And this is the, the risk of dying. I mean, this is our charts now risk of dying, relative risk of dying. You have a twofold increase in gallbladder, pancreatic, uterine cancer, the more overweight you are for women. And then men, we're seeing a huge surge. Used to be cirrhosis of the liver. Now it's actually, it's called NASH, that non-alcoholic liver failure. So it's happening, essentially, it's really fatty, fatty livers. And it's increasing threefold, fourfold risk of dying when you put on more weight. Natural selection. Sorry? Natural selection. Natural selection. <laughs> so the number one thing, tip number one, we need to maintain a healthy weight. Hands down, that is the most important thing. It's, you know, the cart before the horse or, or what have you, but everyone will you know, come into me and I have high blood pressure, I have diabetes, I have hypertension. I'm like, how's your weight? If we can get your weight down, that can help sustain and put some of these diseases at least at bay for a bit. We're hoping. Okay? We have to become aware of our, po our portions, okay? I could ask you, what are you having for dinner tonight? I'm going to go out. You're going to go out. Where are you going to go out to? I haven't thought about it yet, so it's probably going to begin with three or four beers. <laughs> okay, get to the subs. Okay. <laughs> three or four beers. Just interesting. Okay. And what would be the topic? Like Italian pizza? Yeah, probably some meat type product. Okay, so like an American style kind of. Yeah, maybe a steak. A steak. Okay. So he kind of has an idea, right? You get an idea, you go out to eat. You're like, I'm going to have pizza. I'm going to go to the pizza steak. I'm going to go here. get this, but how often do you go one step further and say, okay, maybe I'm only going to have two beers tonight, <laughs> or maybe I'm going to only have one piece of pizza as opposed to, you know, just thinking, okay, we're going to go have pizza tonight. Great. Now, like, do you ever set a rule before you walk in the door of, like, I only need this much, because I know when I get there and it's in front of me, I'm going to eat it, because that's going to require a lot of willpower. You're not going to focus on eating until you're not hungry anymore? Right. So we'll get to that one. <laughs> so we don't put as much thought behind the initial choice of what you want. Okay? So think about that. And I want to know what's a serving. Is it a package, a carton, a container, a trough? Right? I mean, you need to really start thinking how much is too much. You know, the large became the medium, the medium became the small, the small became the child stuff. I mean, this was just an idea that we started at fast food places, right? Just an idea. 
So our plate size has increased. If I had a tush, our tush size ends up increasing, right? Here's the movie theater 20 years ago, and I remember it was like this. Here's the soda pop balancing on the, right? You didn't even have it. You'd go to the movie, this is a concept, and you'd watch the movie, right? Do you remember that? Now, it's, what can you fit? When you lose your cell phone in here, it drops. You, these are, you go, you get like Reese's that can feed the whole row, right? You get popcorn, and then what happens if you finish that popcorn? Isn't it awesome? <laughs> Isn't that so cool? I mean, what they're what's quite in the movie, right? You feel like it's value. It's value added. I get to go get this refill. Yes. <laughs> or I can take it home. You know, people walk out. I see it when people walk out. Anyway, so I want you to just even think of small changes. What is 100 calories? So it's chips. It's like you go to teas, you get 12 chips on the side, right? That's 100 calories. It's 16 crackers, it's three licorice pieces, four Hershey kisses, ice cream, a half a cup. Do you guys know what a half a cup of ice cream is? <laughs> it's a tennis no, ball. No, no, no. It's like really small. All right, so three of soda or lemonade, iced tea, it's a piece of bread, a third of a cookie, quarter brownie. So does this matter? Just little bites here and there? Yes, if you consume this just two to three times a week, 10 days in a month, you actually just put on five to six pounds in a year. And then what happens is we continue to do this every year. In addition to not changing what we're doing, we're even becoming more inactive. And our basal metabolic rate decreasing. So you put all those things together and it makes it very challenging. So there's the realistic and then there's the you wish, right? We all want to be 16 and eat everything we could again, because we all think we can, because we burned it, right? You deserve it, I earned it, whatever it is. You start pulling into that psychological part behind this. But then there's a realistic of what you're really learning. It's powerful. So number two is you need to decide if it's worth it. Right? Some days it, it might be worth it. I want three beers, sure, it might be worth it. But um, I want you thinking of two different things, calories and then content, and if you really want this. So here's a pepperoni pizza 20 years ago, right? They were small. Now, today, we have like Costco and they quarter it. <laughs> you guys have been to Costco, right? And you've seen people like, you know, pick it up and they kind of fold the pizza <laughs> into their mouth. It's like this taco or this burrito. It's dripping, right? And you don't, and then you sit there and go, I don't know what's wrong with our society, right? We all have to do it because there's no other way to eat it. That's a 350 calorie difference. So if I wanted to burn that extra 350 calories, how long would it take me to clean my house? That 350 calories, just cleaning, vacuuming, toilets, good stuff. How long? Hours. Two hours and 45 minutes. Like vigorous cleaning to burn that. What about coffee? I, people come into me all the time and chill. Now I, you know, the French do it. They have coffee and. They use whole milk, and you know, what's wrong with us? I'm like, well, yeah, but it's not bigger than their head. Coffees <laughs> with ice cream scoops in it, right? Pretty much. You know, you, they pump four shots of sugar in it, right? At 305 calories. So what does that take if you're leisurely walking? An hour and five minutes. So that's extra, because the coffee was just an extra thing. Or I challenge you, and I do this all the time, is I'll challenge you and say, okay, if a beer or coffee's coming in, what's coming out? So you gotta balance that. We have these things at the hospital that are called body medium, I think it's user loses them. And they go onto your um, arm and you can look and see how many calories you're burning and it tells you how efficient. And there's a lot of gadgets out there, but this is really one of the the best ones up there that are metabolic parts. And you can see how many calories you're burning. You can see how many steps you're taking. You can log in your food and it says surplus or deficit. So it's kind of an interesting thing. The other thing is I want you thinking about the content. So you think about calories, but then I think quality. Okay? Is this food going to actually do something for me? Is it going to give me something back? Is it going to fight a disease? Could it fight a cardiovascular um, event? Nuts, if you consume one ounce five times a week, it can decrease your coronary heart disease by 73%. That's better than a statin drug. So food can be medicine. 
cancer, three cups of vegetables, 60% decrease in cancer, two cups of fruit, 50%. That's powerful. Most 30% of our cancers are derived from nutrition. You guys know that? Huge. Add more color. We need to think about the quality stuff that we're eating. Thinking about, is something that I'm eating going to give me something that? Is it going to give me the energy? Is it going to make me feel better? So thinking about breaking out your habits of just having your banana at breakfast, <laughs> or you know, we're very habitual in what we do. I have this fruit. I have these vegetables. I have a salad. Expand on it. Try plums. Try broccoli. Try kale. Different things. Okay. The other one is fabulous fats. Make sure you're getting some good, healthy fats that are beneficial for you. Um, critical things for your, it's critical for your good health. It's cellular repair. It aids in cognitive um, ability. So it actually increases that neuron-neuron interaction, which decreases dementia and Alzheimer if it runs in your family. And regulates blood sugar and glycemic foods. So you're not hitting that high and low. Natural anti-inflammatory, it aids satiety. It's these kind of fats. It's nuts, it's seeds, it's salmon, it's fish, getting it three, four times a week. American Heart Association now says three times. And um, for cognitive ability and Alzheimer, they're saying four times. So it's powerful. Yes. What about coconut? You know, coconut's kind of controversial. I would put it kind of in between. Um, there are some studies out there with coconut oil in Alzheimer's and dementia. But um, there are some rebuttals on that as well, saturated fat for cutting protected. So it all depends on which is in your genetic makeup. So I just, you know, had read my, I had, I had, my grandma was very, very, she started in health store in the 1940s. And so I was educated. Well, I thought, but I didn't realize that they were saying you want omega-6, but you don't want omega-3. Is that right? Or is it vice versa? Vice versa. Vice versa. <laughs> vice versa. You want omega threes, and you want to go gentle on your omega six. Um, not to dive into it too much, but omega six with your safflower and, and um, sunflower oil. I put these by the most hurtful to the least hurtful. By the way, most number one hurtful is partial hydrogenation, trans fats, palm oil, and then you get down to the omega sixes: sunflower, safflower, sesame. It's another one. Um, What's happening in the Western diet, we're not getting enough omega-3s to combat those omega-6s, so it's actually a pro-inflammation, and actually, um, even for cancer, too, it's an increased risk. I just read that, and yeah. I never read that. It's the fun part of nutrition. You can always learn more. I mean, I do. Sorry if you know, fish oil is good, but I don't know that vegetable oil could be bad and too much. Yes. So the other thing is, um, a lot of people don't like fish, and they'll say, or mercury, and you know, I just make sure you know, go to gotmercury.org. They have great statistics on which fish you should buy and when and where and locally. But the other thing is, go to flax meal, get some walnut, get some peanut, avocados, and all that, or even do a fish supplement on the days you're not consuming fish. Very advantageous. Okay. <laughs> Are you a stress cat, right? <laughs> what does... Um, Stress has to do with this. <laughs> We're going to crave more sugar the more stressed we are because it releases. Did you like the hair? Because <laughs> it actually releases that serotonin feel good hormones. Okay? So we go to sugar because it's just like exercise. That same thing. Those feel good hormones. And then what happens is the more sugar you get, the more you're going to crave. All right, there's a lot of studies on that. And then what's happening is when our kids, we're getting these sugar bellies, right? Just like pot bellies, they're actually finding there's a lot of studies on they've been like high fructose corn syrup and fructose and how it's equivalent to about a beer and a half for an average child is what they're consuming and impactful, very impactful. So how does our food compare to our liquids? If I said everyone gets a can of Coke, you'd look at me and go, you know, I still have Coke, Coke, you know, Coke's bad, it's sugar. But if I said everyone gets a piece of chocolate, you go, right? So how many cans of Coke are in that chocolate cake? Six. Four. Um, now you guys are like on to me, like 25! I think so many of our drinks have more only in than the bowl of ice cream. Yeah. Yes, yes, some of, the, some of the drinks do. And it's size, right? Like the Red Bulls were okay, but then the Red Bull into these, they get them in a head, right? So um, there's three cans. 
Three cans of Coke. And that's also <coughs> equal to like a scone and, and muffins at Starbucks. Three cans of Cokes. So if you do those muffins. How about how many Oreos are in a Frappuccino? Is my Frappuccino from Starbucks? What size Frappuccino? A Vente Frappuccino. <laughs> 20. <laughs> More than 20, it's the entire package. Now don't say, okay, cool, I'll eat Oreos. It's not that it's great. But I want you thinking about how much sugar, and it's harder when it is a liquid. You don't have a ticker to tell you how much you're actually consuming. We don't have an awareness when it's liquid. It goes in thicker. Just put it right in, really. Okay? So the entire package. Um, I was at SeaWorld and I had to take a picture of this and thought it was powerful. Junk food makes geese obese. Please don't be our birds. Literally 20 feet from that was a candy store. Uh -huh. And I wanted to take that sign and go, junk food makes us obese. Please don't feed us. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it, it's funny. All right, tip number three. I've got to duff my attention on that one. Um, eat breakfast. Does everybody eat breakfast? Yep. Yeah. Wonderful. At one. At one. <laughs> <laughs> you want it within an hour and a half of when you wake. It does increase your metabolic rate by 25%. Studies have shown you do get more. 40% um, of people do not eat breakfast each day. It increases your um, tiredness and irritability when you're not getting it. You have poor concentration, poor problem solving skills, poor muscle coordination. This is very impactful for kids. But what we're finding is it's actually the trend of breakfast. It's not necessarily if you're a breakfast eater. It's more of, are you consuming enough calories at breakfast to where you're not consuming too much in the evening? So what they found, and they've done a lot of studies, if you get at least 350 calories to even 500 calories at breakfast, you're going to consume later not as much calories in the evening. Okay. So it reduces the appetite throughout, helps the blood sugar, and then it's one of your energy, because right, we eat to um, we eat to give us energy. We eat to fuel us, right? But we kind of abuse that just a little. What I want you to do is to think of getting at least three food groups at breakfast. Okay, these are the basic kind of food groups. You start your grains, your milk, yogurts, meats. Eggs, soy, whatever, soy products, the soy veggie dog, whatever you want, soy sausage, fruit, vegetables, and fat, avocados, walnuts, flax seed. Getting at least three. Yes. Does whey protein powder count? Yes. Whey count is a protein. Any kind of protein powder counts. So you get whey protein powder, throw in some fruit, and I'd say put some nuts in there or have it on the side. Yep. That's exactly what you're thinking. Because if you forget the fat at breakfast, you're going to be hungry quicker. Like you have a bowl of oatmeal, hour and a half later, you're two hours later. But you throw walnuts on top of the oatmeal, throw some craisins on it, or add some fresh berries, blueberries, it's going to sustain you. Yeah. Yeah. The fact that you're not hungry at breakfast time, uh -huh. does that reset you for later in the day eating when you're not hungry? Bless you. <laughs> um, does it reset you? What do you mean by that? Does it stop? If you force yourself to eat a better, bigger breakfast than yes. you used to, yes. do then you tend to eat when you're not hungry because you're eating breakfast when you're not hungry? No. Studies have shown that you do not. It's a theory that you're actually eating to give yourself energy. And then at the end of the day, you taper off. <coughs> right? But what happens is we pull in... Um, the social and behavior aspects or psychological aspects of the evening. I deserve, I'm hungry, I'm angry, I'm lonely, I'm tired, I'm stressed. It's my time, I deserve at the end of the day. It's not very intuitive. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, you have milk down there. What about rice milk and almond milk? Yes, rice milk, almond milk, grain milk, hemp milk. They're all enriched, same thing would be like a dairy. But not better than dairy? Um, it depends. Some people, it, they're getting up there. Their products are getting better and better, comparable to dairy. The only thing they're missing from dairy is one protein. It's called conjugated linoleic acid, CLA. 
And that has been shown to do some um, decreased gain in the body fat with kids. There's been a couple studies, but I'm by the Dairy Council, so I'm not sure. Question. Question. Well, when they add the, um, the sweetener, the vanilla, and yes. stuff, does that show? I mean, is that adding extra sugar? sugar or? I prefer the unsweetened, too. Unsweetened. Yes. Because you get used to that sugar. Yeah. You, you get so used to it. Good question. All right, so fact or fiction? Yes. What's the story of eggs these days? Eat them. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you do, right? Yes. Poor egg. Egg and like potato got such a yeah. bad rap. You're like, oh, no, I can't do potato. Potatoes are great. Yeah. You have so much rice, you know, or pasta. Eat a potato. Um, <laughs> in the skin, fibrous or sweet potatoes. The egg. They are changing what they're feeding a lot of beef. Chicken. So there, you are seeing more and more omega-3 eggs. So they're feeding the chicken, the flaxseed, the whole grain canola oil. So it's recycling at its finest because of the change of the composition of the egg yolk. It's like a corn-fed cow versus a grass-fed cow. Mm -hmm. no. Difference. Free-range, free. Free-range, cage-free, free -range, cage -free <laughs> feeding them good, healthy stuff. It's yeah. going to affect your egg, and you can have more eggs in the week. <clears throat> yes. What, um, you hear a lot of debate about dairy. Yes, you know, what, it, I saw earlier you said less than 2%. Is that? Less than 2%, so 1% are non fat dairy is what I would recommend. <laughs> Definitely. And same thing with yogurts. You want to tend to go, even Greek yogurt, go to the 1% or non fat or 0.5%, some of the Greek they do. Shabbat or some of the stuff like that. <laughs> what if you can't consume dairy? Because of the lactose, is there something you should do instead? If you can't with the lactose, then you want to go to the almond milk or the soy milk or the rice milk or the grain milk. And a lot of people who are lactose intolerant can actually tolerate yogurt because of the probiotics of yogurt. So test that first to see if you can tolerate the yogurt. And if you really can't tolerate the yogurt, then it's probably more than just the lactose. It could be the whey, the protein specifically. Okay, so the sodium in the four ounce chicken breast is equal to a side of french fries. True or false? False. False. True. True false. because it's your basic foster farm chicken. <laughs> yes, this is what's in the standard chicken. MSG, salt, sodium ruthenate, trisodium plus A, multiple antibiotics, and actually arsenic. But yes, um, consider, to go back to that. So they have MSG and regular chicken breasts? Yes. Well, not. However. Can you cook it at home? Don't put it on? No. This is what's in the package. You bring home a foster or whatever or whatever package, this is what it is. So, my proposal if you're going to purchase something organic, another big meat, get your chicken organic. Get the meat organic, get the cheese and the milk organic. That's worth putting money into. And then the other thing is, these are the dirty dozen. These are the highest pesticides, fruits and vegetables. It's got the highest dietary recommended um, things you want to avoid. So celery is one of the dirtiest, right? You take home celery, there's even you know dirt in it. You got to clean it out. So that would be worth considering buying organic. Peaches, strawberries, apples, cherries, kale, blueberry, you know. This is a really good one. It's called the Dirty Dozen. You guys should get to know that or Google it when you get home. Sweet potatoes, baked potatoes, all um, organic. So um, dried apples um, from New Zealand. Do you think New Zealand is, I think they're better than us with respect to pesticides? And, but you know what, I would look it up. The um, Environmental Nutrition Work, Environmental Nutrition Working Group, I think it is E. E-N-W-G. And this, they have the Dirty Jazz on their powerful, it's a great nutrition website. And they um, they would have that on there. And it's just, you question, sometimes you think, oh, I need to get the organic blueberries. But then you realize, oh, wait, no, I want to get the ones that are from which country. You know, it might be, you know, not the U.S. ones, but more of European, but then some other ones are um, sticking within the U.S. Well, most of them are sticking within the U.S. Do you have a question? When you say organic, I think we all understand organic, but do we buy them canned, frozen, or in fresh produce? You know, that's interesting you say that. Um, 
frozen is actually even better than canned because it's preserved at its highest nutrient quality. It's usually cheaper. So? Or fresh, if you can get it fresh. But when you buy it fresh, I mean, even if you buy it at the farmer's market, and ideally it was picked yesterday, it's losing nutrients for it's all the time. It's oxidizing, exactly, yep. The sooner the better. Or you stick with frozen. So, so you're saying frozen is, is best? Ideally, it's the, it's the number one way to get it, yeah. Unless you can go out and pick a strawberry, take it home, and eat it. And then canned? And then canned would be your last. Result. Last? Mm -hmm. Yep. Let alone then canned with fro added sugar in it, which a lot of them, or even high fructose corn syrup in it. Your previous slide, um, do, they, do they add sulfites also? I was just looking at even just the sodium alone is astonishing to me with the antibiotics. I'm not sure. I would love to say yes, but I don't know for sure. Good question. Okay, tip number five. Drink fluid. Water. 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 I should say water. I should emphasize water as opposed to just fluid. Because <laughs> you're all sipping wine. Water. It is the number one overlooked performance enhancer. Okay? Hydration is critical for temperature regulation, performance. Ideally, you want to drink half of your body weight. Okay, so you're 150 pounds, 75 ounces at minimum. That includes tea, water, milk, soups would be fluid, and fruits and vegetables are actually pretty watery as well. Okay? Some conditions that increase your need for water. Um, the winter chill, their sensation goes down about 40%. Altitude makes a difference. We have an increase in diuresis up here, and we have a decrease in our thirst response. So you cannot say if you're thirsty, you are already 1 to 2% dehydrated. And that's going to affect your performance if you're an athlete. <coughs> Exercise, your intensity and duration affects it. Fitness level, trained versus untrained. The more you're trained, the more you need more water. Muscles need water. Heated, recirculated air, very, very common, as much as in the summertime. Body size, illness, elderly children, all need increase in water. Especially if you go out, right? Cold stress stimulates our kidneys, decreases our urine production. Um, significant loss in respiratory because of the cold, dry air, which is a huge amount of loss up here. And then excessive clothing, you're increasing another layer of sweat loss. So think about fluid in the winter. A lot of times we do not. All right, last question here. Factor of friction. Is 100 crushes a day increase your belly fat? She's actually cuter than my stress cat, though. <laughs> no. <laughs> Wendy's going to talk about it now. Well, I have a question. Yes. Um, in terms of coffee in relation to hydration. Yes. Coffee's a diuretic, right? Yes. So if you drink coffee, how much more water should you drink? Consider yourself starting at like negative one. Oh. <laughs> Unless you're taking. Having like a latte, where you're getting milk. Like just plain black, black coffee. coffee, negative one, so you need an extra glass for that. Teas as well, green tea. Tea's different because tea you can get, well, green tea you can get as much as much um, caffeine as um, regular, it's like 45 milligrams. Some of them can get up there. Is green tea as great as everyone says it is? If you know, if there's some really good benefits of having green tea. But there's also really good benefits of having coffee with Alzheimer's, so. You just got to make sure you're getting enough fluid to combat the amount of caffeine that you're getting. Parkinson's also. And Parkinson's also, yes. My parents didn't do more than coffee. However, when you have... <laughs> so you're trying to... Um, but when you have cancer, but when you have cancer, when you're drinking, it puts like fuel into a fire. So just, you know, you have to know your genetic makeup and take your risks with doing what's going to work for your body. Yeah, whiskey, wine, beer, what, what, any of your lists. Yeah. It wasn't, uh, no, Wendy's going to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> so now for the fun part. We get to talk about what we get to do, how we get to play. What I'm going to talk about is five different tips around exercise, how we need to do one over the obesity slides, how we need to move more, and we just need to sit less. Plain and simple. A new type of warming up, movement preparation. What's the right intensity to exercise at? and what is the best activity to do as an exercise physiologist, uh, 
it's exercise physiologists and basketball people ask me all the time, what's, what's the best exercise, what should I do, does it matter? So I'll talk about that, and then um, functional movement. All right, so first of all, we need to move more. So how can we increase our caloric expenditure in a day? So it's not just about a formal exercise, how you need to plan that hour a day to do skate skiing or running or whatever your activity is. It's how can we get more activity, more movement in our day? So it's chores around the house. If you're working and you have a, have a sedentary job, it's how can you every hour get up at least for five minutes and walk around your office? Or if, you know, if you're in a building and instead of emailing someone down the hall, you actually get out of your chair and you walk down the hall and have a conversation. It's walking more, it's playing more. Um, it's just being a more active person. So to burn one pound of fat, it's a negative 3,500 calories. Right, so if you look at the calorie charts, um, I have one right here. If you look at, say, walking three miles per hour, it's really 250, 280 calories per hour that we're burning. So if you're doing your cross-country skiing, you're looking at about 500 calories an hour, and that's moderate to vigorous activity that you burn in 60 minutes. So. It's a lot easier to lose weight with your diet. Jill and I kind of go back and forth. What's more important, is it the food or is it the movement? It's really the food when it comes to exercise. You really gotta decrease your You gotta decrease your caloric intake. Yeah. Although, exercise is important to keep that weight off. If you don't exercise, you're gonna lose it right back up again. And muscle mass. And muscle mass. So the exercise increases your muscle mass, which is more metabolically active, so therefore you burn more calories when you're, when you're just sitting. All right, so is it really worth it? I don't know. You have to look at your diet. So if you want to lose weight, first thing, you got to cut back those calories. All right, and then you got to add in the exercise and keep, keep it up. All right, second tip, movement preparation. Over time, they've said you have to warm up for your activities. So what is the warm up? Well, it's, you know, if you're going for a walk, you want to walk a little slower, you get on the treadmill, you, you start slower and you get going. Well, that's great. Well, this is a newer philosophy over the last couple of years called movement preparation. And what it does is it really prepares your body for movement. Um, it's a series of dynamic exercises, really. Instead of just doing the activity that you're going to do, you cycle, you walk, you swim, you bike, whatever it is that you're doing, you actually engage in these exercises for the first five to ten minutes before you start your activity. It's going to get you warmed up. It's going to increase your heart rate. It's going to prepare your nervous system for the activity. You have to engage muscle mass to do these exercises. So there are a series of movements that improve your balance, flexibility, and your mobility. So um, an example would be doing knee hugs. So as you're getting ready to go run, you do your knee hugs. So you pull your knees through your chest. You have to balance. You have to engage your core. Then you take a step forward. You do another knee hug. You balance. You engage your core. You do it across the room. You do it back. Another exercise would be walking lunges. You do your lunge. You're having, it's a strengthening exercise as well. So, so depending upon what your fitness level is, it actually could be you know, part of your regime to do these exercises. It could be walking and grabbing your heel, balancing, stretching your quad, engaging your core, taking another step. So um, there is a website called uh, www.coreperformance.com. And all of these exercises are on that website, so you can go on, there's videos, you can look at them, and in incorporate them into whatever activity that you're doing prior to. So this is your warm-up. So instead of the old philosophy of stretching before you do your exercise, that's kind of out. You want to do your static stretching after. So movement prep contracts your muscles, activates your muscles. It gets you ready for the movement. It improves your long-term mobility and flexibility. So it's going to actually help you more long-term as opposed to the short-term effects of the static stretching. It makes your body stronger because you're doing these exercises that you hadn't been doing before. Um, it can increase your speed, power output, so you do it before every training session, before any activity that you're doing. And if you're going skate skiing or if you're, if you're on the hill downhill skiing, you can, you can mix it up and do certain exercises that you can do while you're standing with your skis on, that sort of thing. There is a place for the static stretching, but that's going to be after your exercise. 
So this is your relaxation. This is where you're holding a stretch for 30 seconds. Um, it's the goal to relax. It helps you cool down, raise your heart rate down, raise your core temperature down. Um, it improves your flexibility short term, and, and it feels good. It's going to help with that delayed onset muscle soreness. So when you're going to do a workout, any type of activity, you always start with that movement preparation. You do your, your workout, you stretch for 5-10 minutes at the end. So here's a list. Another one would be a hand walk. So it's going to be standing, I'm not going to do it in front, but you're going to walk your hands out into a plank position, so it's the push-up position, and you walk your feet in. So it's like an inchworm. You walk your hands out, you walk your feet in. So you're engaging. The plank is a very difficult strength, strengthening exercise. So if you did that across the room, you're warming up, you're strengthening those muscles, strengthening your core, getting ready for the movement. Or straight leg walks. You lift and you lower. You don't just kick your leg up there. You lift and you lower. And you're stretching that hamstring and you lower. So it's just a different philosophy, but it's really effective in getting you warmed up and ready for your activity. So here's an example of, um, this is the world's greatest exercise where you go down and you stretch your hamstring and then you go into a lunge position at, at, as you go across the floor. So it's, it's difficult to demonstrate, but like I said, it's um, coreperformance.com is the website. You can get videos on this. All right, intensity of exercise. What's the best intensity to exercise at? Should you go lower? Should you go higher? Should you go as hard as you can all the time? Um, well, it kind of depends on your goal. So the first thing when people come in to talk to me, they always ask me, well, what should I do? What should my heart rate be? What should I put the treadmill at? It's like, well, first of all, what's your goal? Is your goal to lose weight? Is your goal to imp improve your, you know, your 10K time? Is your goal to just overall health and get a little bit fitter? The American College of Sports Medicine recommends 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise most days of the week to maintain your health. 60 minutes if you want to improve your fitness or improve your health of moderate intensity most days of the week. So there's the guideline of how much exercise you should do at what intensity. Moderate intensity. Okay, well what's moderate intensity? So moderate intensity is going to be different for everyone. It's going to be a different heart rate. It's going to be um, maybe even a, a different perceived exertion because you know sometimes I'll do treadmill tests on people and it'll be very light and they'll perceive it to be very hard because they're not maybe used to exercising and they don't quite know what's going to happen. Or on the other side, you know they're exercising all the time and they're pretty tough. This is pretty easy, you know. So you kind of have to take that with a grain of salt. But you can learn your own perceived exertion and know what it feels like to go at a moderate intensity. So any physical activity that elevates your heart rate to a moderate or somewhat hard intensity is, is the definition. Um, guidelines for sport performance and for weight loss, you got to do at least 60 minutes, but you want to stay within that moderate intensity health benefits 150 minutes per week versus the 300. So we've gone into that. Things to keep in mind, the harder you exercise, the more calories you burn. So if you go back to that 3,500 calories and you have burned one pound of fat, um, keep in mind that if you exercise harder, you're going to see more results calorie-wise. You're going to burn calories faster, you're going to lose weight faster. Um, aerobic activity is the type of activity that actually burns fat as a fuel. So there's three different fuels that our body burns. We either burn fat, and most of us have pretty much an endless source of fat on our body, literally. Um, carbohydrates, which is the sugar, the glycogen that we have stored in our muscles, or glucose, which is the limiting fuel or source of fuel in our bodies, and protein, which is pretty insignificant unless you're doing very long distance activity. And I'm talking long. So most of us in this room are never going to tap into that protein. It's really fat or carbohydrates. When you exercise as hard as you can, you're burning carbohydrates, or the sugar in our body, 100%. So let me explain this a little bit. This is my, my favorite little graph. Um, across the bottom here is intensity of exercise. So this is zero intensity over up on the far right there is 100%. So keep in mind that the harder you exercise, this red line in here, that's your heart rate. The harder you exercise, the higher your heart rate goes, the more calories you burn. Plain and simple. Doesn't matter what you're doing, what your heart rate is, the higher 
more calories you burn. The, f the, the different fuels that we burn, fat and carbohydrates. Fat, we burn a higher percentage of fat fuel sitting here. We burn about 60% fat in a resting state. But the overall calorie burn is pretty low, all right? As we exercise, our fat burning utilization increases. And it increases to about, it's different for everyone, but it increases to about 60%. And it peaks, and then it starts dropping. And your fat burning drops off at what's called your anaerobic threshold, which is different for everyone, but it's typically about 85% of your maximum. So right around 85% the fat drops off and the carbohydrates increase proportionately to the increase in the heart rate. So there's kind of this crossover effect. The harder you exercise, the more carbohydrates, the less fat you burn. So if you ask me, what intensity should I exercise at? It depends on what your goal is, but yet it really doesn't because everybody should be exercising right around the same intensity and that's right here for the most part. Okay, right in here is about 70 to 85 percent of your maximum and it's moderate to somewhat hard as a perceived exertion. So on a scale of 1 to 10, you're looking at a 5, a 6, maybe even 7, right to where that anaerobic threshold is. What the anaerobic threshold is, is physiologically, it's the, it's the onset of blood lactate accumulation. So the physiology behind that, just to sum it up, um, in the Krebs cycle, you have to you want to produce energy, and in order to produce energy, you have to have oxygen, you have to have carbohydrates, you have to have food, um, and you have to have fat. So you have to have all those ingredients in order to make energy. And the byproduct of that is carbon dioxide. So we blow off more carbon dioxide, our ventilation increases, we get out of breath, and we also uh, produce lactate. Blood lactate. So when you're exercising, maybe some of you have all experienced this, you feel pretty good, you're going along, you're in this aerobic, steady state, it feels good. So you're here, you feel pretty good, you're able to cruise quite a long time, you know, hour or two, depending upon your fitness level, right in here. And then you bump it up just a little bit higher, and it's like, whew, this feels hard. You know, it's like 7, 8 out of 10. Your muscles start burning. It's like, okay, I can keep doing this a couple more minutes, but I don't know how much longer after that I'm going to be able to do this. So all of you know that feeling. Your ventilation increases. If I'm testing someone on a treadmill, I can tell where their anaerobic threshold is just by listening to them because they'll be able to talk to me. You know, they'll be like cruising along. And then the next thing you know, I hear this, you know, the ventilation gets up, you know, and it's like, okay, you know, like, yeah, I can go another minute. Okay. So that's where that is. All right? It's your fatigue threshold, it's the lactate threshold, anaerobic threshold, there's all sorts of terms for that, but essentially it's the place where your fat burning drops off, it's where you're no longer aerobic, and you can't continue on for very long. So ideally, like I said, you need to stay right below that for the majority of the time, but that's not to say that you don't ever go above that. There's certain times that you do go above the anaerobic threshold, and that's to get fitter, it's to get faster, and it's to burn more calories, but you only do it sometimes. So, um, just to sum up the, the fuel burning, kind of went over that already, but intervals. This is where you go above the anaerobic threshold. So, intervals are short bursts of high intensity exercise. So this is where most of us probably don't go often enough because it hurts a little bit. It's harder, it's more than what we do, it's not comfortable. So. You don't want to go there long and hard. These are the workouts that you do that are kind of shorter, maybe 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, depending upon where you're at, you know, in your, in your typical regime. Um, but it's like one minute hard, a couple minutes rest. It's going hard for short periods of time, and then you go back to that moderate intensity. So the key is, is that it's up high intensity, and then you come back down to recovery. Recovery is the key piece. So if you're a mountain biker or a skate skier and you're out there and you're going up and you're going down and up and down, there's your built-in intervals because you're going hard and then you recover on the downhill. Um, the problem is, is if you're just going up Don or Summit on your bike and it's just on and on and on, you, know, it's, it's, you have to, um, if, if you're doing an interval type workout, you need to just control that within your cadence or within you know, the intensity or you, you walk, run, walk, run if you're on a hike or, you know, 
So you catch my drift. But the key is, is that it's moderate intensity to hard intensity. And ideally, you do a workout like this at least once a week. Okay, so it's once, maybe twice. If you're exercising five to six days a week, it might be twice a week. If you're doing three to four days a week, it's only one day a week. But represented of your workouts like 25% of the time. And the benefits of this, it's going to increase your overall calorie burning, because the harder intensity you go, the more calories you burn, right? So you'll, you'll get leaner faster. Um, you'll burn more fat during the exercise because you're going longer and harder and after the exercise because you have that double burning effect where the harder you exercise, the longer your metabolic rate stays elevated after exercise. Um, it'll increase your fitness level. So the goal with your fitness is to increase that anaerobic threshold. So if you remember, I said the anaerobic threshold is the place where you get fatigue. It's where you feel tired. It's where you don't want to go hard anymore. If you can push that level to a higher level, then you're more efficient. So instead of going at a heart rate of 130 comfortably, you get fitter, you're able to go at a heart rate of 140 or 150 comfortably. You know, so just like any other muscle, your cardiovascular system gets more efficient at doing work. So you can go longer and harder and perform better. And if it's not so much a performance goal that you have, and it's a weight loss goal, you burn more calories. And if it's just an overall health goal, you're just going to be overall more cardiovascularly fit. So Overall, it's good to push your push yourself a little bit. Yeah. Doing it with a friend makes it easier. Doing it with a friend, absolutely. So so do it on the days that, that you're um, in the pool with a group or you're going on a group ride or you know the hardest thing to do is go out for your own workout and make yourself go hard. You know, with no clock, no accountability to anybody else. But yeah, definitely do it on a day that you have somebody there or if you're by yourself and you're on a piece of exercise equipment, it could make the time go by faster. Because if you're just slogging along at the same old pace, doing the same old 30 minutes that you do every day, you know, make, make it a, a goal that, okay, I'm going to warm up for five minutes, do my movement prep, I'm going to get on the treadmill, and I'm going to do one minute hard and three minutes moderate. And during that 30 minute workout, it's going to go by, that, go by like that because during the recovery piece, it's going to feel so much easier. And it's what you were doing before. So it just feels better and it gives you something to think about. Okay, so pick up the pace. If you feel good, go a little harder. If you don't feel good, don't go harder. You really need to listen to your body. Maybe it's not the day to go hard. So get a little more out of your workout. Stop spinning your wheels. So you want to train smarter, not necessarily harder all the time. It's not more is better. It's take the volume that you're doing and smarten up about it. Like, Increase the intensity and look at, okay, what do I, and every single day, before you go and exercise, ask yourself, what do I want out of this workout? What are my goals? So you go in there and you have purpose and you have a schedule of, okay, this is what I'm going to get out of today. I'm going to work on increasing that anaerobic threshold and getting faster. And that's where you do your intervals. Or you want to work on your endurance and you want to just go longer and maybe a little bit more s slower, more moderate than you normally do. So it's variation within your workouts. How do you know if it's the right intensity? Um, I do VO2 testing, VO2 max testing at the hospital over here at Incline Village uh, Physical Therapy. And we put you on a treadmill or a bike and we do gas analysis where we measure your oxygen uptake to give you target heart rate zone so you know exactly where your heart rate should be. So there's a scientific method. But you can also go off of your rating of perceived exertion. So how hard am I exercising on a scale of 1 to 10? And like I said, you want to be moderate to somewhat hard. When you do your intervals, it's hard. And the top test. This is the simplest, most practical way to measure your intensity is can you talk? If, if you can't talk, you're going too hard. You know, if you can't communicate and you're just out of breath, you're going too hard. But on the other end, if you're able to just chat away, no problem, you need to bump it up a little bit. Okay? What does the best activity do? So I get asked this. Well, should I do yoga? Should I do CrossFit? Should I do the circuit training class? Should I do... You know, group X, walking, sports specific, whatever. You know, it's like, and my answer is always, well, what do you like to do? Because that's going to be the best exercise for you to do. Although, I do think there needs to be some balance within what you do. So, when I say balance, I'm saying the guidelines are you want to do three to five days a week of aerobic activity. So, what's your aerobic activity? Is it biking, hiking, skate skiing, running, walking? 
any type of activity that's going to elevate your heart rate. So you've got to get that in three to five days a week. And then you supplement it with some strength training, which I'll talk about in, in just a minute, the functional exercise. And that would be yoga, Pilates, CrossFit, weight training, any sort of weight, um, body weight exercises. You want to do that two to three days a week. And then there's the flexibility piece. It's the movement prep. It's warming up. It's the yoga, Pilates, stretching, those types of activities, which you also want to throw in there once or twice a week or do daily stretching for five to ten minutes. So it's really a combination of all of them. Um, where I have a hard time is if one person just does one exercise all the time, you know, and they're just doing running, you know, so they get very tight. That's, where you, that's what leads to injuries. Or they're just doing yoga. Or they're just doing CrossFit. You know, so it's that one exercise that can cause injuries of repetitive um, motion, of you know, getting tight and not stretching enough and not being strong in the core, which you need to be really strong in your core for all these activities. So it's the mix, throwing in a little bit of everything all the time and mixing it up. I just want to go to Tabata class, and it's kind of something that just puts you in very hardcore, but I think it would be considered strength, but it's something that would be nice when you to add in as a really good core. Yeah. Is it like a kickboxing kind of class, or what is it? Um, it's it's very high energy music, and then it's like being in boot camp for an hour. And literally, I mean, you're doing push-ups and jumps, and mm -hmm. I, I was so yeah. sure the next day it was ridiculous. Yeah, so there, there's boot camp classes, circuit training classes that are both aerobic and strength building at the same time. Um, and that's great, too. Um, yoga. People ask me where that fits in a lot, and, and typically, I would say, you know, stretching and flexibility, but it's not aerobic because you don't elevate your heart rate and, th and that type of activity. Most of the time, you're lying down. I mean, we use the body medias to look at how many calories you burn during these different activities. And honestly, Jill and I only burn an hour. I mean, in an hour yoga class, 100 calories. You know, because it's it's you don't elevate your heart rate, and it's directly correlated. So that's not to say that it's not a beneficial exercise to do. It's very beneficial but not for the purpose of weight loss. You know, so you gotta go back to what's your goal. If you wanna lose weight, you need to be doing aerobic exercise and you need to be doing some strength training to get some muscle mass to, burn, to increase your metabolic rate. So it's the combination, but yeah, if you can get both in an exercise, like you know, if you're going hiking up a hill and you're getting your heart rate up and it's like this, then yeah, you're gonna build strength in your legs and you're also gonna get your heart rate up. And, you know, so it's a combo. So yeah, throw some of that stuff in there too. Yeah. Should you do yoga before or after aerobic exercise? It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter the, the, the order of any kind of exercise. The benefit you get from that exercise is going to be the same. You know, so okay. people ask me if they go to the gym, should they do their strength training first or their cardio first? It doesn't matter. The only thing I would say is just make sure you warm up for both of them. So you always warm up, do whatever you like, mix it up. Sometimes you do one before the other, but it doesn't matter. The benefit's going to be the same. This might be way in one direction because it was from a yoga instructor, but they said that by doing yoga first before a bike ride, you actually can have more energy and be more long-term on your bike ride. Um, that could that could be true. It could go back to this the concept that I'm trying to get across for movement preparation, that you're warming up your body, your, your nervous system, you're warming up your core temperature, you're more alert to exercise. So your performance might be better if you're going to with the goal of improving your performance, you know, but as far as what you'll get out of it, like the benefit would the be long, the same. In the in the long run, yes. yes. Either way, like you said. Yeah. But stretching is better after cardio. Stretching is better. Static stretching is yeah, better after, after cardio. Which yes. There's a lot of stretching. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 Question. Yeah. As women, as we get older, of course, we lose our bone mass, and we're supposed to do our weight training. Um, could yoga is strengthening, so is Pilates. Could, could that take the place of some of the weight training, or yes. do you still recommend the actual? Oh weight no, training? I think it could absolutely take the place because okay. for for reducing osteoporosis and building mm -hmm. bone density, it's all about weight bearing exercise. Mm -hmm. So as long as you're you're weight bearing, doing body weight exercises, whether it's a plank or whether it's you know, some version thereof, visualizing the core, you're still engaging strength and you're still on your feet. Mm -hmm. 
The difference would be is if you did it in water, where you're weightless, um, where you wouldn't get that benefit. Um, but, you know, we don't do that, really. You know, so, yeah, I mean, weight-bearing or type of exercise is not literally lifting dumbbells. It could be anything, yoga, Pilates, anything. Yeah. Okay, functional movement. Uh, I'm sorry, do you have another question? Yeah. Right. You haven't commented yet on if you do aerobic exercise, then when your heart rate comes down afterwards, you will, I've heard, you will burn more calories at that resting heart rate than you would have if you wouldn't have had the aerobics beforehand. And if that is true, how long well, does that last? Okay, so it is true that when you exercise, after exercise, I should say, after exercise, your metabolism is elevated, regardless of of what exercise that you do. So, and the harder you exercise, the longer it will stay elevated after. But if you did yoga before or after, you're saying if you do that kind of exercise before or after, it's going to be more beneficial. That's what you're saying. Well, I'm wondering how long the effect lasts. Okay. So the effect, the effect depends on how hard you exercise during will affect how long it lasts afterwards. And it also depends on your fitness level. The fitter you are, the longer you're gonna be a better fat burner and a better burner also. So the fitter you are and the higher intensity you exercise during your workout, you'll have that lasting effect. So whether you eat immediately after, yeah, because your metabolism's elevated <coughs> after, or whether you do some sort of yoga class or stretching class after, is it going to be more beneficial? It's going to be beneficial either way. Does that make sense? Am I answering your question right? Yes, and then maybe you can comment on, does that mean, would you be better off, if you had an hour to exercise, would you be better off half hour high intensity and then four hours? and half hour high intensity and then four hours. So oh, so you're doing like intermittent stuff. exercises to keep or your metabolism. Or one hour high intensity yeah. and then the rest of your You know, day. the difference is gonna be insignificant. I would say whenever you can get the exercise in is when you should do it and not <coughs> plan it out depending upon your metabolic rate. You're gonna burn however many calories during that workout and it's gonna stay elevated. So overall, it's gonna be the same in a day whether you do 15, four 15 minute sessions or whether you do an hour. It's the intensity that you're doing it and how long it adds up to. But it sounds like it is good to do it. It doesn't matter. I mean, calorie wise, health wise, performance wise, you're still getting the same benefit from that exercise regardless of when you do it. We was even a study that just came out last week about <clears throat> doing exercises later in the evening that actually affects your sleep. Negatively. No, it's just positively in the study. Oh, so it goes both ways. Positively. So yeah. and again, it depends on, on the person. Because yeah. some people get elevated and they can't sleep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other people, it takes away the stress that they can sleep. So yes. It it <coughs> so when you do it, that's when I say whenever you like to do it, what you're going to do, whatever you like to do. Because overall, at the end of the day, it's how long did you exercise? At what intensity did you exercise? And there's your calories, and there's your health benefit and, and performance. So, so whatever you do at the end of the day, the metabolism is burning calories while you're sleeping. Yes. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, functional movement. This is my last tip of the day. We're already over, so I'll make it quick. Um, functional movement is any type of exercise that's functional. Like, for instance, it's not really all that functional to do bicep curls or tricep extensions like this, you know, it's not to say you should never do them again in an exercise class or in the gym, but why not do more functional movement where you're doing lunges and you're engaging your core and your whole body doing this exercise and you're, um, it's, it's, um, it's a series of movements that you're going to um, use in your daily life. So functional st strength. So. That could be, I do have all the exercises, I'll go through them, but ideally you would want, I have top 10 exercises that are functional and that you can do with little to no equipment. So ideally you would do these t types of exercises two days a week, two to three days a week at the most, um, two to three sets. So this is something that you could incorporate into your regular 
routine that you do, you, it could take you maybe 20 minutes. Do a minute of each exercise twice through. 20 minutes, right there. So, mini bands. I say no equipment, but here's the first equipment that you need. Have, if any of you have seen these, like from physical therapy, they're little bands that are six inches long, and you put them around your ankles, for instance, and you can work on hip stability. All right, so you put them around your ankles and you literally walk, keeping your legs straight or keeping them bent, but you don't let your feet come together. It's resistance and you have to work on that stability of keeping your feet apart. It really builds that hip stability. Because when I say core strength, which I've been referring to a lot tonight, core strength is not that six pack abs that we all think, like, oh, yeah, I want those abs, but it's really not. It's your whole core area, your hips and your shoulders. So it's from here to here. You gotta have strength back, abs, sh shoulders, and uh, hips. So to, how do we increase that hip stability? These little green bands you put around your ankles and you can do side to side walking, or you can do forward walking. Okay, so here's one exercise. Squats, don't need any equipment. You just plain and simple, just do squats. If you wanna add resistance, you can hold on to some weights, rocks if you're out on the trails, soup cans at home, add resistance as you squat, you raise your hands to counterbalance, keep your, your knees about hip width apart, and you just do squats. If you want to make it more difficult, you can do them on single legs, or you can squat and jump between. All right? Lunges. Most important thing with the lunge is that your knee lines up with your ankle here, that you don't have that forward you know, if you're here, you don't want to move forward and have your knee go in front of your ankle. That's going to be, put added stress on your knees. So make sure you drop straight down, that back knee goes straight down. You can do forward lunges, backward lunges, or lateral lunges. Okay? Push-ups. My least favorite exercise in the world. But it's probably most of our least favorite because it's the hardest to do. So push-ups, you can do them on your knees, your toes, or you can put your feet up on a stability ball. Do as many as you can. You're engaging your whole core. Rows. This is something you can do with a machine in the gym or just a simple TheraBand. If you want a TheraBand, Incline Physical Therapy has them for sale here in Incline or at Tile Forest Physical Therapy. You can get them also in Truckee. But you're using that back, seated row. Bicep curls. With the bands, you can use the rocks, the soup cans, whatever. Tricep push-ups. The difference between a regular push-up, your hands are wider. You're going to be utilizing more back, your pecs, your shoulders, versus a tricep push-up, you're going to have your, your arms, your hands pulled in, and as you drop down, your elbows are going to just brush your side. So it's a lot harder because it's going to isolate your tricep, the back of your arm. Okay, they're really hard. You can do them on tables or you can start doing it on the wall to start with if you can't do it on the floor. Bridges, great for your glutes. You lie back, tighten those glutes. You can start with both legs on the ground, just lifting and lowering your hips. One leg or you can put your feet up onto a stability ball to make it a little tougher. Plank, number one exercise. Just hold your plank for as long as you can. Do it three times each day, you're gonna get a lot stronger. And then obliques, this is gonna work your side here, just by getting in that position with your knees up and rolling your knees from one side to the other side. And to make it more difficult, you can lengthen that lever of making your, your knees up the tabletop or you straighten your legs from side to side. So those are the top 10 exercises. If you want a copy of those exercises, you can put your email down on the back and I can email those exercises to you on that sign-in sheet. And um, does anyone have any questions for Jill or I? Thank you for taking all the questions you have here at the top and the direction that is really, really helpful. So here's our emails too, if anyone wants to email us. Um, Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, you're like 
the idea of, did you guys hear the question, intermittent fasting, just, um, oh, sorry, in my zone. Intermittent <laughs> fasting, um, we have to stand in here. So. Um, I think sometimes we eat too much in between our meals. I feel like breakfast, lunch, and dinner is very advantageous, creating our own little fasting. I feel like if sometimes we're snacking all day, we go nosh all day long, and it's constantly secreting insulin, and our body's working kind of overtime. And I don't know if I necessarily agree with that, because um, there's a lot of studies on that. I don't know how I feel about the breakfast. I like getting right out of the gate. Usually, I mean, most of the studies show like within an hour window, start getting fuel and drinking that fast. So I prefer the fasting from a noon to you know, 6 o'clock when we tend to get that 3 o'clock dive and we go for sugar. Because so we haven't got enough protein or, you know, whatever it is, earlier on, so we did not get enough calories earlier on. So I feel like I don't eat until noon. Mm -hmm. I have like 12 and a half hours and I have 12 and a half hours. So you get good volumes. Yeah. yeah. But still, yeah, a deficit like for probably you, but still the calorie, total calorie oh, yeah. burns. Yeah, could burn it at all. Yeah. Yeah. I play with it a little bit. You probably have to the muscle to burn to keep the mind going in the morning. Right. Muscle coordination. Yeah. And then if you have coffee, if you're putting milk in it too, then you are getting calories. No, I just do this. Straight. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Depends on your body type, yeah. I would question the, um, the sustainability. So my dog was like, it's really not going to be Yeah. I don't know if it's going to be Yeah. Can you post it? Yeah. If your leg or your any body part cramps before it exhausts, what's that telling you? It could be any of things, <laughs> honestly. It could be, it could be that you're not warming up enough. It could be that you're not eating enough. Calcium, magnesium, and go to the antioxidant. Thank you. Go to the antioxidants and things like that. It could be It could be It could be, yeah. It could be, it could be your shoes. I, someone told me that today. It was, oh, my shoes. Oh. So make sure you warm up if you typically get cramping, that you warm up slowly and up for a longer period of time. That's what I'm exercising. What about cramping at night after hard exercise during the day? What, what do you do about that? You take calcium and magnesium? Yeah, calcium and magnesium is the first one you go to, and then we can show you the potassium as well. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And stretch? Yeah. Yeah. Stretching after. That's a problem. It's so hard. It is a serious problem. A lot of people do have that. Yeah. It's hard. Then there's one big comment I have about nutrition. It's that we need to make it simple. I mean, there's so much of these students in this country, especially some of these students where people may not be able to practice or they're not going to be able to do something. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Right. So there is something even the government can do. It's just yeah, encouragement. Absolutely. Yeah. Almost and and like you said, Michelle, she's trying to get the campaign. Yeah. 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 But no, we need a nationwide <laughs> awareness. Yeah. You know, actually, I actually applaud um, Tom Forrest because when I've been working on a program the last year is called the Beef Fit. It's through the Nutrition Coalition, and they've put you know a good chunk of change into going into the school districts, and we've been doing um, activity bursts with one, like kinesthetic learners, just moving them five minutes twice a day, and then doing nutrition education with a theme each month. So this month happens to be hydration. Mm -hmm. um, and like last month was sleep, going in and talking to kids about sleep. A lot of kids, parents get home, if there's so much behavior and financial issues in our um, states, maybe go on forever on <laughs> this, but um, kids aren't getting fed till like 8 o'clock at night, and then their growth, human growth hormone, they cannot go to sleep because insulin and human growth hormone interact, it doesn't release, so kids' metabolism are getting dumb, and then they crave sugar in the morning. I mean, there's so much insulin and hormonal effects, in addition to the psychological effects, and they get up in the morning, and then they just crave sugar, they have a glass of juice, and then like today I was teaching them, I'm like, you have a 12 ounce can of Coke, you have a 12 ounce thing of juice, how much sugar, what's the difference? They're exactly the same. And they're like, oh, that juice was so much. I'm like, no, you might as well have a can of Coke at breakfast. So just impacting and trying to get out to the education in the schools and then changing the school lunch program. We've been working with the food service. And it's hard. It takes, it's a slow moving barge. And we need a faster moving. <laughs> the ship. kids have to be at school at 7 a.m. when their prime sleep time is right there. In and then they go home and they study all night. Yeah. yeah. Yep, it's it is it's hard. It's really hard. Thank so. you so much for coming out. Thank you.